Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Sancta Ioanne Baptiste, ora pro nobis. Sancta Bernarde, Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. For this is he that was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, A voice of one crying in the desert, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. And the same John had as his garment of camel's hair, and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. When we hear of St. John the Baptist that his meat was locusts and wild honey, we are immediately surprised and struck by his, what appears to be us, severe asceticism. Locusts, also called uh, grasshoppers if you weren't familiar with that, were at that time already consumed regionally as a normal part of people's diets. It is important to keep that in mind when we approach the figure of St. John the Baptist, not because it diminishes his asceticism, but because what strikes us as very amazing as North Americans would have not been so surprising to desert dwellers. I will go so far as to say that, um, and I tried to find out, more about this, but this has been commented on by authors of um, commentators on the sacred scripture for a long time, and they pointed out that contemporary to St. John the Baptist, at least the Ethiopians did include that in their diet, though many ancient philosophers actually spoke on eating locusts, and they did not, they thought it was a particularly um, unhealthy food to dine on. Amazingly enough, today, it is a very popular food in Pakistan, and it is becoming an increasingly popular food as a means of virtue signaling amongst the most elite classes, because they view an insect-based protein diet as a solution um, to uh, needs for caloric protein sources that aren't cattle. In Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, verse 21, flying insects are explicitly allowed to be consumed. But we can draw from this three considerations that I wish to put before you. The first was that St. John, and most obviously, he consumed locusts because they were easily at hand to where he lived, which was the desert. Locusts, if you're familiar with how they behave, when there is a drought, they in a very uh, arid place, they always gravitate towards sources of water. When we've had a heavy spring, they are everywhere because there is abundant water and puddles everywhere for them. But the more arid the climate, the more they would have to live near the few sources of water in a desert. And St. John, being a man, would have also had to live near at least an access to water. A water which, of course, he used for baptisms, penance. They were frugal fare. No one would accept eating locusts in choice over eating a fatted cattle, lamb, or grain, the very creature looks repugnant to taste. And whatever means they make invent in order to make them palatable, we know if you've ever stomped on one, their insides are full of goo. And one can only imagine that their skeleton gives them, although I've read that uh, cooked it's quite mild, a quite bitter taste. 
We can take from this that because he took these things that were free and near at hand to him, but this is a good imitation for the manner in which we, as imitators, at least in the sense of being men under vows, men of penance and men who have been called, to always eat what is readily at hand. This is the perfection outlined in the Gospel. This is the perfection that St. Francis of Assisi, of course, had the Franciscans follow. And the knights, having used to rely extensively upon almsgiving for what they ate when they were deployed in the Holy Land, that they ate what was readily available to them. And throughout the history of the Church, we see that many of the unique dishes the Catholics have ate throughout the ages, whether it was snails of France and frog legs, alligator in Louisiana, or any type of animal that was cheap and maybe repellent to the taste, that, because frugality is linked to our poverty, is linked to the fact that we should, as the Apostle says, be satisfied with food and clothing, that we should always be willing to take what is near at hand. It is very often you see people take eating and turn it into an act of religion, and I'm not talking about the bread of life. And as somebody who likes to cook, or at least, and I like tasting various foods, I am also deeply aware that four hours or several hours taken away to either prepare a dish or to travel to eat some delicacy can be a horrible and superfluous activity that detracts us from the service of God. So that is what is obvious. It's not so much the locust, so much as it was there and available to him, and he took it and he ate, and he was satisfied by it. But the second one, and more importantly, is I believe that locusts, whether or not this was intended by God or it's something that we can draw from the text, are a symbol of sin. One grasshopper, if you've ever had one make noise, although they aren't as loud as crickets, nevertheless, nearby you, they're quite irritating. They destroy your plants, but if there's only a few of them, you can easily knock them out of your garden. And one locust is easily stomped on underfoot, like one venial sin. But a swarm of locusts is destructive. A locust swarm can travel over 81 miles in a day. In fact, one time it was recorded that they traveled 3,100 miles at once in over 10 days. Locusts were the eighth plague of Egypt. Quote, this is what the Lord, the God of Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your fathers nor your forefathers have ever seen from the day that settled in this land till now. Now you might ask, how does a locust plague or swarm come about? Why are they so an appropriate metaphor for sin? And why John the Baptist then ate sin? in a sense. Locust swarms come about because of what I just said. In a desert, the creatures wind up congregating near water, but when it is, there's not a drought, they spread out about. But then, when there's a heavy rain, when a drought ends, and everything becomes lush and green, something happens in the mind of locusts. They begin to mate, or put all their energy towards mating, far beyond what they would normally do. And in a very brief amount of time, 
even though locusts only live a matter of months, I believe it's about six months, a massive swarm, hundreds of miles even long, or pardon me, many square, hundreds of square feet in size, to the point of being literally to darken the sky, can amass of these devastating creatures. So deprivation, followed by abundance, brings on extraordinary conduct, excess, excess. And that excess leads to hunger, and that hunger leads to destruction. See, when man is without God, and he seeks out worldly things to satisfy himself, after he has, but if he later then is deprived of those things, because he has not sought God, he still hungers within himself, and he goes out seeking, like the devil, whom he may devour. We all know this. Almost every revolution in the history of man was followed by, a, uh, preceded by a war or famine, oftentimes both. So hunger is stirred up within man. And then some abundance, either found there or coming after, cause these swarms of locusts to go and destroy and consume. Now, if the locusts were in a sense consumed, if they had an eater, if there were predators who during this mating time, that is, the time where the rains have come and new green grass was growing, if there were sufficient predators for them, they would never be able to mate in such a way to be able to come overcome everything. And so, just like with St. John the Baptist, who made locusts his food, whether for himself in the sense that he ate or he repented of his own sins, although there are some people who say that he never committed a voluntary venial sin, but men like John the Baptist and his followers by eating their sins, it never allowed for to be a swarm. Not only did they constantly destroy sin within themselves, but then making, in a sense, sin their food, sin was never able to amass into a destructive force. And so that is the way of a penitent. A penitent not only takes upon himself his own sins, but the sins of others. He makes them, in a sense, his food. Now, when we have been deprived, or some of you have been deprived of the Mass and the sacraments this year, because of this thing, this whatever social, so, uh, societal phenomenon, what we'll call it, because I don't want to call it anything else, there nevertheless was still one thing that we always will have with us, no matter how the sacraments are denied to us or the church pushes us away. And that is, as long as we have our sight and our senses and our bodies, we can see sin, we can detest it, and we can, in a sense, feed off of it to motivate us or to sustain us out of penance. Why? By seeing the sins of others, we have a source for sorrow and repentance in ourselves. And the most important thing in our life is repentance. Seeing the sins of others detaches us from this world. It makes pleasures bitter to us. We become weighed down with sorrow like Christ in the hopes of expiating it for God. And even if we were to try to have pleasures, because we are aware of the sins of others, we know that if left to their own devices, they will come eventually and destroy us. Because the sins of others form into a plague that destroys society, as we are witnessing right now, ravaging from place to place. But it gets worse. Because after a locust, Plague. You know what happens to all the locusts? They always start to death. Sin is death. Sin does not bring any life into the world, and sin can never sustain itself. And 
after the locusts all die, all these dead grasshoppers are all over the ground, and as a result, there's almost always a rodent explosion of scavengers. Desolated fields, famine, scavengers, and with rats come disease, and rodents come disease. And so with almost every locust storm, historically, it has been followed by a period of punishment with the plague. The locusts can be destroyed, and people have tried to fend them off throughout history using fire, which is zeal, and of course using um, uh, nowadays poison, which is technology, although I don't really, other than suggesting war, I don't really And finally, I'd like you to consider that even though um, that John himself, being a man of both correction and consolation, and his meat being both locusts and honey, that in a sense he was what he ate. That is, he had people come to him with his, their sins, that was his bread, right? Because man liveth not on bread alone, but every word that cometh forth from the mouth of the Father. That his mission was to see people away, in a sense, to destroy their, not destroy their sins, but at least remit the punishment through repentance. And finally, on the question of the locusts, is that in order to eat a lot of locusts, he would have to be an exceptionally quick man. <laughs> now, if sin is an allegory, or locusts can be an allegory for sin, it must, one must be swift in their consumption. What does this also tell us? That while we may see the sins of our neighbors and use them to motivate us onto the greater love of God, works of penance, in the confession of our faith, we should not, we need to be quick. We must grab them and eat it quickly. There's no savoring of sin. There's no need to dwell on another sin that you see. It is enough to see the sin and know that it offends God. You may meditate on iniquity, but do not meditate on the sin of your brother that you would seek to destroy and consume. That is, to sustain your own zeal. So if we see sin, let us snatch it quickly to grow in our own strength and the love of God. But let us not try to savor it in the mouth by considering it deeply. I need not meditate on the strange behaviors I see with people in their bodies to even think about these things extensively as harmful to a man. But will I see it and use it for course to repent and offer penance on their behalf? Yes. And the more astounding the evil, the more, in a sense, I can find in myself, right, a desire to see it destroyed and to see God exalted. But it said that he ate the locusts and honey. It didn't say... It didn't deviate the two. The two were mixed together, and I think this is very important. Because honey is a great symbol of grace. Our Holy Father, St. Bernard, says, misplaced my quote. But you can take it for me, from my uh, memory then that um, in uh, St. Bernard's homilies for Advent, he talks about Christ being specifically the bee. 
the bee write that God, being the bee, landed on the flower, which is Mary, um, and that uh, of Christ himself, right, that it said that he would eat butter and honey, alluding to the prophecies of Isaiah. But when we consider honey as a substance, it makes a perfect allegory for grace for, the num for numerous reasons. One is that honey is the product of a hive. A beehive is always busy, and so the angels of God and the saints are always busy laboring everywhere in the world for the accumulation of grace and the glory of the kingdom. And so John, in a sense, ate honey, that is, he ate what God gave us, for God is, you know, the mystical body of Christ is one person, we are one with him. And that by mixing this grasshopper, I mean this locust, with honey, it made it sweet to the taste. What is repugnant to nature, that is their sin, is sweet for two reasons. That one, by consuming it, we show the love of God. If we consume it with the desire to see him glorified, that is destroy sin and make repentance for it. And then also, that um, uh, um, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I mixed it up. But, um, and that also, in addition to sweetening the food, honey, if you're familiar with, is one of the oldest medicines uh, that mankind has ever had. I recently treated a mouth ailment this year by just putting honey on it every night until it went away. Uh, numerous home remedies that go back to ancient times are also remedied with honey. And so we see that not only does it sweeten the life, but it also fixes things within us. St. Bernard marks that there are two, and I will quote here, quote, Learn from me by means of these words to expect a twofold help from above in the course of your spiritual life, correction and consolation. One controls the exterior, the other works within. The first curbs arrogance, the latter inspires trust, the first begets humility, the latter strengthens of God the faint-hearted, the first makes a man discreet, the latter devout. The first imbues us with fear of God, the latter tempers that fear with the joy of salvation. As the words of Scripture indicate, let my heart rejoice that it may fear your name and serve the Lord with fear and rejoice before him with reverence. And so we see that there is a perfect union here in the consumption of these locusts with honey, of both correction and consolation. My point being earlier with the grasshopper being bitter, when it is mixed with honey, it becomes sweet. Its texture is still what it is, but it makes it palatable. Consumed quickly, it strengthens the body. And so when we see God giving us, in a sense, food to eat in these times, we can ask ourselves, is this the food of correction or is this the food of consolation? And oftentimes, the answer is the two are mixed together, that in our correction is found the consolation. In every prayer that we make that is good before God, if we were to look at it, we're either asking God to correct us or we're asking God to console us. If I pray for salvation, I am praying that God correct me for my sins. If I pray, for example, that more brothers move here for more vocations, I am praying for what appears to be a consolation, but in reality it is also a correction. For living amongst other brothers, you become humbled by their example, you endure their corrections that they offer to you, you um, uh, both draw the consolation of uh, mutual prayer and a mutual uh, labors.
So on that note, for this retreat, in addition to the handout that we had, I would invite you to consider in your own prayer life, especially with long intentions that you may have had for years, or things that you have long desired, to ask yourself if you are asking God for either consolation or correction. I would encourage you to examine the question that when you see the sins of others, and today it is so visible and is so in your face, do you make this your meat, or can you make it your meat? And if you cannot make it your meat because it is too repugnant to you, then you must ask God for the grace of honey, that he might make you hate these things, as the psalmist says, with a perfect hatred. That is, you hate them for the sake of God, and you would see them destroyed and end, but you would see it done according to the way that he wills, which is oftentimes through people repenting and truly destroying their sin or giving it to Christ so that he may destroy it, rather than being destroyed like the locusts, which will eventually, after they destroy everything, starve to death and bring great afflictions on the rest of mankind. One last note, locusts and grasshoppers, as I said earlier, and the ones, no doubt, that John the Baptist ate were solitary. They most of the time travel and live by themselves, doing their own thing, except when they mate. A very appropriate food, once again, for our solitary John the Baptist. It is important to remember, and one of the strengthening aspects of our brotherhood, is that there is great alleviation from temptations to sin when you're around others. And that the great monastic masters always thought the ideal of this life was a small group of monks, somewhere they all varied between three to twelve, being closely working together, praying together, and working out their salvation together. And that being a solitary uh, should only be done after many years of being tried amongst the company of others. So consider that a little bit of a plug for our brotherhood. But also consider that while it can be frustrating at times to deal with your neighbor, that the church <coughs> and the other Christians around us greatly aid us in uh, not becoming a uh, creatures of sin, and that it does take a man with the resoluteness of the John the Baptist to do it himself. Normally I ask for questions, but it seems inappropriate today because it's been shoot. But I will ask if anybody wants me to clarify anything or if they think I said anything wrong so we can correct it for the, the video. It is 11.42, there will be sex at the church in about um, 